Welcome to Plugged In, a series of podcasts hosted by Hatch, focusing on green energy transition and sustainable solutions. I am Yinka Ogundui. I'm Phil Lombard. And we'll be your hosts for today. Today we have Thomas BBN. Thomas is the Global Director of Battery Materials and Recycling and Hatch Battery Market Solutions. This covers the development and engineering of facilities and infrastructure and the lithium ion battery value chain for battery chemicals and battery recycling. Welcome, Thomas. Glad to have you with us. Hi, Inka. Hi, Philip. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Um, so, Thomas, just before we go into the topic for today, which looks into battery chemistries, could you provide our listeners with a brief overview of the battery value chain? Yeah, sure. So the, the lithium ion battery value chain really can be broken down into six pieces. First, the, the mining and the refining, then battery grade material preparation, followed by battery material uh, preparation, then uh, lithium ion cell manufacturing and battery pack assembly. Then obviously the application, like for example, an electrical vehicle. And the last one would be the recycling. So diving a, a bit into those different ones, going back to the mining, we would have, for example, nickel cobalt that would be extracted from uh, laterite ores or sulfide deposits. Lithium would come from brines or hard rock, uh, like the, the spodumene and graphite. Two ways really to get uh, graphite. First one would be to extract graphite from natural mines and refine it in order to produce coated spherical graphite. And the second one would be a conversion of needle coke to produce synthetic graphite. Then diving into the second one, the battery grade material preparation, we would be talking about the preparation of, for example, nickel, cobalt, manganese, a battery grade metal sulfates. So those are the ones that are going to be used in the next uh, box of the value chain, which is the battery material preparation. So for nickel, cobalt, manganese, uh, going from the sulfates, they would be converted into hydroxide and that would generate what we call the PCAM, so the precursor of cathode active material, which is NMC hydroxide. Then the PCAM would be mixed with a lithium product, either lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide monohydrate in order to obtain the CAM, the cathode active material. That's the material, it, it's powder, it's a black powder that would be used in the lithium ion cell assembly. And then, as I mentioned before, um, cell manufacturing, uh, battery pack assembly, application, and recycling. Interestingly, the recycling actually fits and loops back into the value chain because once the, the used lithium ion batteries um, reach uh, end of life, that they can be crushed. And then that becomes the primary resource to uh, extract nickel, cobalt, manganese, and lithium. And that circles back into the value chain and battery material refining. Awesome. Thanks so much for that brief industry primer there, Thomas. Could you maybe walk us through about the different battery chemistries and how they compare? Yeah, right now on the market, we're really seeing two main uh, families of uh, cathode materials. We're seeing the LFP and the nickel rich. First, let's start with, with the nickel rich. Um, for example, NMC standing for nickel cobalt manganese or nickel manganese cobalt uh, is, is one of those nickel rich uh, cathode chemistry. And um, that even the name doesn't imply it, there's lithium in that and it's an oxide. So it's lithium, NMC uh, or NCA. Um, there is, uh, as I mentioned, the second type of nickel rich material, which is the NCA, which is nickel cobalt aluminum. So these two ones, NMC and NCA, they are derivated from the pure um, cobalt uh, cathode material, so the LCO, that we've been using for three decades now in portable electronics. In, in that chemistry, the cobalt has been substituted by nickel and manganese or uh, aluminum in order to obtain high performance uh, batteries because the cobalt does not provide uh, performance uh, properties uh, and, and that's being brought by nickel and uh, manganese or, or aluminum. 
talking about NCA chemistry uh, because it's been the one that has been used now for a decade in Tesla cars. The second um, category uh, family that I mentioned earlier is the LFP. So LFP is the lithium ion phosphate. It's an olivine structure. It's a different uh, chemical uh, crystal structure compared to the NMC and NCA that are layered materials. And this LFP has, um, has lower specific energy, uh, specific capacity compared to NMC. So in, in simple words, it means that it can store less energy than NMC-based batteries. And if you use that in a given application, it means that the LFP battery will not run as long as the nickel-rich battery to really overly simplify. And Historically, we've seen that LFP um, have been uh, widely uh, produced and used in China, mainly because it's been uh, highly subsidized by the Chinese government. And uh, more recently, in, in the new electrical vehicles that we saw in Western countries, we've, we've seen so NCA being used as, as a chemistry and also uh, NMC uh, being being used. We recently seeing uh, LFP batteries being used in, in Western countries as well, but it's really an extremely recent trend. Thank you for, for that insight, Thomas. Uh, so what are the common themes that you've observed so far in the evolution of battery chemistry types? So first, we need to understand and explain how the, the battery pack is being made of. So it's single lithium ion cells that can be in different shapes, cylindrical, prismatic, um, or a pouch, that are being assembled into modules. And it's then those modules are being assembled together into the pack. And uh, from the modules, the, the modules are being connected together. Um, and we add also the, the BMS, the battery uh, management system, and that gives you the, the battery pack. So from the lithium ion cells to the modules to the pack. And um, I, I'm not a cell manufacturing expert, but I understood over the years that the LFP based uh, battery pack would be easier to, to, to do less complex, at least, than, than the nickel-based ones because the thermal management of LFP batteries um, is not as complex as what it is with, with the nickel-rich ones. And what we're seeing in, in the industry uh, is really an evolution of, of the structure of the pack and how it's being made. So we, we went from that lithium-ion cell to modules to pack. Now, some companies are trying to avoid the modules and going directly from the lithium ion cells to the battery pack. That's what we, we've seen, for example, from BYD, who recently started to commercialize their blade battery. And, and it's using exactly that, uh, that cell to pack um, technology. And, and now the idea is even further than that, trying to get rid of of the pack itself and go from what they call cell to chassis. So it means that the chassis here of the car for, for an electrical vehicle application would behave uh, as the battery pack. So we're not there yet, but we're seeing that this is what is being uh, envisioned by the auto industry, regardless of the, the types of lithium-ion batteries that would be uh, produced, either the, the conventional ones like we know today using a liquid electrolyte or the, the solid state batteries, the cathode materials that we just discussed before, LFP and nickel rich, would still be the same here. It's just the main difference would just be that the energy density between the conventional lithium-ion batteries and the future solid state batteries to come in the next years would be that the, the solid state batteries have a higher energy density. Great, thanks for that, Thomas. Speaking more on the evolution looking forward, how do you see the market evolving over time and how does the supply and demand balance for some of the input materials impact that? Do you think that LFP batteries are the future to help curb the demand constraints for nickel? So generally speaking, we've seen a tremendous demand in lithium ion batteries during the last years, and that will continue to grow in the upcoming years 
because of the rapid development of uh, electric mobility and also more development on the energy storage, uh, stationary storage side. And we've seen that LFP chemistries have been neglected by the auto uh, OEM in Western countries during the last decade. And it's simply because it, it can be explained as follows. 10 years ago, the price of lithium-ion batteries were around $1,200 per kilowatt hour. And these days, it's around $140, $130 per kilowatt hour. So it was almost 10 times more 10 years ago than what it is today. So as a consequence, 10 years ago, when you wanted to do an electrical vehicle, you were targeting a battery that would contain high energy density because at that price per kilowatt hour, uh, you want to spend the lowest amount. So that's why in Western countries mostly, they were targeting nickel uh, type of, of chemistries and that's what happened with Tesla and the NC. Meanwhile, in China, we've seen a lot of uh, LFP being produced for batteries. So the, the issue with LFP from 10 years ago, six years ago, was that the energy density was the energy density of the battery pack was much lower than what it is today. So the autonomy of the battery of the car was not as good as what it is today. And that's what really changed in the industry recently is all of those evolutions in LFP battery pack assembly really help to increase the energy density of the overall pack, making now LFP batteries really suitable for applications that require um, a high energy throughput, like what is required for electrical vehicle. So really we saw the auto OEMs designing more and more energy efficient cars as well in order to get the best out of the batteries. And in, in parallel, what I just mentioned about the improvements on the LFP based uh, batteries. So now, we have LFP based batteries that are able to run for 400 kilometers and more when it was not uh, possible to envision that like six or seven years ago. Thank you, Thomas. And following up on what you said about the improvement in technology, we're also seeing research into some other cathode materials. For example, we're seeing manganese rich battery chemistries. How does this change the market going forward? And we looking at this from two different perspectives. So from a battery material demand point of view, in terms of lithium nickel demand, and then also looking at it from the customer's perspective in terms of energy density. We're releasing three types of manganese rich batteries. And two of them are actually derivated from the, the two ones that I mentioned before, LFP and nickel rich. So the first one is um, the LFMP. So it's lithium, iron, manganese phosphate. So here it's just the iron from the LFP that has been substituted by manganese. And this material would provide a higher um, energy density than the LFP and it could substitute the LFP at, in the upcoming years. Then the other one that we are seeing is uh, a derivative from uh, the nickel rich cathode chemistry, where instead of having the nickel being the highest content of uh, element in the material, it would be the manganese. The crystal structure is the same as in the nickel rich. It's just that we have, for example, 75% manganese and 25% nickel in that material. And the other advantage here is that there is no cobalt in that material. So that's all of the materials we're hearing about these days from companies calling these the, the cobalt-free cathode chemistries, that manganese rich is one of those. And we know that, for example, BASF and SVOLT are working on that uh, manganese-rich derivated from, from the nickel-rich. And the third one is LNMO, standing for lithium nickel manganese oxide. This one is a better version of the LMO, the lithium manganese uh, oxide, that we, we've seen being used in the, for example, the Nissan Leaf uh, for over uh, 10 years. It was used at the, the beginning of the Nissan Leaf. Uh, a certain amount of LMO was used in those batteries, but it was not performing really well in terms of cycling and discharging over the years. So having here uh, a bit of nickel in that LMO really improved the, the properties of the material. And that's the, the spinel material and 
companies like Nano One, Materials, and uh, Holder, uh, Topso are working on that LNMO spinel material. We're really seeing a lot of R&D and more advanced than R&D now that it's pilot projects trying to demonstrate that uh, these materials can be used in the batteries. So from a, a material synthesis point of view, we know how to make those materials. Now the, the challenge was during the last years, how to make them behave properly in the battery for thousands of cycles. And we've seen really tremendous improvements recently, for example, uh, liquid electrolyte additives that have been uh, discovered that really improved the energy cycle life of the battery and also some more advanced um, uh, processes for coating those manganese rich material to make them more stable during the, the charge and discharge and use of the battery. So that's really what, what we are saying and those manganese rich battery actually really sit in between the LFP and the nickel rich in terms of, of price and, uh, and, and performance. Thank you, Thomas. This has been a very insightful uh, view into the current battery chemistry landscape and can't wait to see how it evolves uh, with time. Great. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure to talk to you about it. Thank you. Stay tuned for more episodes on Plugged In and don't forget to subscribe, like and share.